Whether you keep them in your home or love to see them in theirs, these are the creatures that bring us all together. Reptiles. Reptiles. We're going to be delving into the experiences of reptile lovers from around the block and around the world. This This is is the the Reptile Reptile Talk Podcast. Boom. What is going on, everybody? This is Jeremy Turgeon from Brass Man Reptiles. And I'm Rob, and I am not feeling well right now. Actually, I, I feel okay, but my voice is shot, so. <laughs> yeah. This is Rob's least sexy voice. Yeah. I can't. <laughs> I can't. Even smoking Marlboro Reds. <laughs> oh, no. Marlboro Smoke. 100. Smoke. <laughs> <laughs> I've never smoked a cigarette before. Oh, man. Well, good, because now you're expressing what it would be like, and we don't want that for you, Rob. Yeah, we don't need that emphysema. <laughs> oh, Jesus. What are they selling? Oh, God. Chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, dude. Episode one oh five. We've been uh, we've been away for a little bit because, as per usual, things have been crazy, hectic. And, yeah, and I can't stay in one place for more than five minutes. Forty five minutes. Yeah, um, yeah. So <laughs> I'm not even home now, but it's fine. So, <laughs> but we're here yeah, tonight. Tonight's, I... tonight's episode is going to be tight as fuck. Tonight's episode. I'm super super stoked. So if you missed all of the advertising, because we really made sure we pushed this one, we're talking about Amazon tree boas all night tonight. So Boom. if you came here for garter snakes or ball pythons, you are in the wrong place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not tonight. Not tonight. no. Not tonight. Not tonight. And probably like not ever. But, uh, well... <laughs> I love to talk garter snakes. As garter snakes would be cool. Yeah, garter yeah. snakes would be cool. Um, but yeah, so super excited to be talking about that before we bring everybody on, cause this is going to be a long episode, yes. uh, guaranteed. Uh, how are you, Rob? I, besides my voice being poop, uh, I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> a bunch of the baby scrubs have started taking frozen thawed, um, uh, getting second, third, fourth sheds out of everybody. So that's pretty cool. Hell yeah. I, I'm kind of steving off of breeding things uh, this year. I think I'm not going to breed anything uh doing lots of herping and then we got the herp society meeting coming up on sunday, sunday. you're gonna be doing Mike norman uh yep. herping trip that's where last year we caught the eastern hognose snake so yeah pretty tight, along with a bunch of other stuff that we saw but the hognose snake was definitely the highlight Hell and yeah. uh what else is going on i don't know there's a bunch of things this weekend's the raleigh show blah blah blah, blah. yeah yeah all that, all the, and Tinley. There's yep. Tinley happening. As Tinley's well. this weekend too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, bam. Heck yeah. Heck How about yeah. you? Uh, I'm doing well, man. Things have been super hectic. Uh, I've been traveling a lot for music, as anybody who's been following me knows. Uh, thank you for coming to the show last night, Rob. I definitely appreciate that. We had a great time tight. in Durham. Hell yeah, we had a great time in Durham. Um, that drive back though, sheesh. Mm. <laughs> But yeah, so it was it was all good. Uh, very excited. Uh, soon, it sounds like I'll be able to announce some other stuff that uh, that I've been working on. So I'm very excited about that because if you thought Tyrese was a big deal, uh, there's Just more. Wait. Coming. There's more. Just coming. wait. So very excited about that. Um, yeah. Other than that, I'm breeding a handful of things this year. Uh, very very mm. select. Um, but I am excited for uh, the Herb Society meeting. Uh, this Sunday, super excited for that. And uh, what else? What else is happening? Um, I'm excited because I have decided. I've told myself. I've decided that at some point in April, I'm going to go see Liney. Uh, and I'm excited and horrified for both of these things. So, <laughs> so he lives between the two of us. Yes. So we should just do it. I mean, I'm down, and inevitably he'll pop into this chat and talk his shit. So we'll just bring back this point. Um, but uh, all right, before we get started and bring on our guests, uh, we've already gotten hit with some super chats and super stickers. Uh, so I just want to shout out these wonderful people, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry, for the five hey. Canadian dollars. Fancy money. <laughs> yeah, how's that? Oh, no, we appreciate really? it, man. I don't know. It's it's like a buck, but no. <laughs> No, definitely appreciate it, man. Thank you for the, all the continued support, my friend. Definitely very much appreciated. And then uh, Mark Tavius. Thank you, Mark Tavius, for the super sticker. Definitely appreciate that. 
Um, and I think that is it. So as always, guys, if you want to interject in our conversation about this wonderful species of snake, feel free, feel free to throw uh, a super chat or a super sticker at us and we'll highlight your comments. Um, uh, our buddy Tim at Intrepid Exotics is here. Damn long time. No see. Shush. We know. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I was thinking maybe we should do like individual episodes where we just rant for an hour. I'm I'm very much down. <laughs> I'm very much down for that. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, there was like a couple of weeks where I was like, I just got a lot of reptile stuff that I don't want to just get off of my chest right now, and I was just like, I don't know if I should do that on the podcast or just do it on my <laughs> Instagram or something. Why not? Why not? <laughs> because I don't know. I don't know if that's that's uh, if this is the appropriate venue for people to get some of that stuff, but. <laughs> is what it is so. <laughs> oh gosh too funny okay so let's bring our guests on i'm just going to bring them all on and we'll have them all introduce themselves um so let's join us i will tell you right now there's one person that seemingly is going to be popping in and out just because of reception <laughs> and i'm going to give him shit for it all night <laughs> but here we go let's see bam Bam, bam, boom, bam, bam, bam. All right, we got every, the gang is all here. How's it going? What is up, What's everybody? Up? Hello, hello. Oh, you made it. Dude, you did. I'm, yeah. I'm so pumped. This is going to be a tight episode. And uh, I think that me and Jeremy were talking about it before, but we're just going to have you guys go through and introduce yourselves. We'll probably just start at the top. Sorry, the top. And then we'll just work our way around. Uh, so this is going to be an Amazon Tree Bowl roundtable. So how about uh, we'll start right over here, over there. Over there with Jake. We'll start with Jake. My name, my name's Jake Brooks, Amazon <laughs> Eden. I've been collecting Amazon since uh, 1998. Damn, hell yeah. Heck hell yeah man. uh we can come oh 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 perfect timing perfect timing ian, ian. <laughs> introduce yourself my friend oh he's oh, muted is he frozen <laughs> oh he's is he frozen and muted no he's muted oh all right we'll, we'll come back to him we're coming we'll back come to back. you <laughs> <laughs> uh i'm randy piggies uh just randall piggies on instagram uh, randy piggies on facebook uh, i've been keeping reptiles off and on my whole life uh amazon trio boas since about 2011 but didn't really start getting into them heavy until about last five years hell yeah hell yeah and i'm rory gresco i've been keeping and breeding amazons for about 15 years now the creme de la creme the creme de la creme for sure <laughs> Oh, I... Where am I? Am I next? Yep, you're <laughs> next. No you're Ingram. Next. <laughs> <laughs> no Ingram two by two reptiles. Um, I've been breeding them longer than even the creme de la creme, but uh, <laughs> but I haven't made anything near as nice as what he makes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm Dayton Croydon of HDR Boreals. Hell yeah. And then yeah. All right, we're coming Ian... back to Ian now if, <laughs> if you're unfrozen and can unmute yourself. Uh, oh, yeah. Ian. <laughs> it's Florida. This is it, right. Damn it, Florida. <laughs> Just another reason for you to suck. <laughs> Strikes again. Damn. With the internet. Yep. Well, luckily, <clears throat> his whole name and business is, is in his uh, little name bubble there. So that's uh, frozen green shirted Ian Bissell from S&J Reptiles. And he does more Amazon stuff, if you didn't already know that. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, oh, look at that. And he's gone. He's mad. He's been offended. Um, <laughs> so, uh, okay, guys. So we'll, we'll start this off really, really simple. Uh what got you into Amazons in the first place? Whoever wants to chime in first, yeah. go right yeah. ahead. Yeah, we'll just start with Jake again, and we'll go down, yeah. I guess. It's yeah, um, I was in a pet store in, here in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, and uh, I bought a uh, Colombian red tail boa. And uh, there was a book on uh, the little twirly black book stand mm -hmm. that said uh, boa constrictors. And I was like, cool. So I picked it up. You know, I didn't know anything, didn't know what I was doing, had no clue. I buy the snake, put it in a 10-gallon aquarium. It's a small one. Feeding it uh, fuzzies. 
and uh, I could have been feeding it hoppers or something like that, but again, I didn't know what I was doing. And I opened this boa constrictor book up, and I flipped the pages, and I cut, and I see a red Amazon tree boa. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God, I've got to have one of those. <laughs> I mean, everybody's reaction when they see a red, you know, you're like, yeah. wow, that's beautiful. It's, I mean, it's I didn't know they came in colors like that. I had no clue, you know, and so – um, I ended up contacting my local pet store and asking them if they could get their hands on some Amazon tree boas. And they said, sure. And they said, how many do you want? And I was like, I'll take two, a male and a female. So I gave a little bitty male and I don't think he was established. And I get a big angry female. <laughs> and, uh, from there it's history. I just, uh, I went, I, I spent a little time in the military as a cavalry scout. So I didn't have snakes then. But I've had three large collections. I've bred. I've started babies off. I've had babies that wouldn't eat. I've had every kind of problem you can imagine with a snake <laughs> um, from, you know, res uh, respiratory infections to, to prolapses to you name it. So I've seen a lot. I've, uh, I've done some of my own veterinarian work. Um, and genetically, these snakes are like the ball python of the ar arboreal world. So there's a lot to be gained with this species. There's a lot, a lot of knowledge and understanding that we yet don't know, and we we have to prove it out as a community. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think that there's a lot for Amazon tree boas to offer, and I think that as we're getting generations into breeding, we're going to be finding out that it's not as random as a lot of people think it is. And there are definitely ways that we can track some of these breedings. So let's head on down to Noah over here. Bam. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. Where do I start? I'm 40 now. So back when I'm like 16 years old, I started working at a place called that fish place at pet place in Lancaster near my house. Oh, I've, I've been there. That place is tight. Yeah. World's largest pet store, right? It's huge. <laughs> like, it is huge. So, Obviously, I shot, I shot um, the you were on. Yeah, thank you. Go watch. I got my. This is my boy. This is my uh, more important, more important What's animal up, in the What's house. Up, man? <laughs> I didn't know you were um, a proven breeder. I, I, yeah, I am. I am. I have two, hear. <laughs> three, actually. What's that? I hear. No, no, no. Go watch it with Dizzy. Go watch it with Dizzy. I got to tell a story. It's my turn to talk. Uh, <laughs> All right. So, uh, um, 16 years old, I started the fish place. They got this giant Burmese python. I just know I like reptiles. I don't know. I want to work in that reptile. Right. So, so I start working in there and very quickly after buying, you know, one of everything, um, I realized that everybody kind of had their specialty. There was a guy who liked garter snake, he had a ton of garter snakes. And there's a guy who has, Dart frogs. He has a ton of dart frogs, um, et cetera, et cetera. Tegus, this guy, you know, whatever. So I'm poor because they pay me like minimum wage, seven and a quarter an hour, right? But I'm happy because I'm at the fish place. <laughs> like, um, and I realized I got to have a specialty. So what do, what do I like? What's cheap and cool? <laughs> like, <laughs> so like, Amazon tree boas are super cheap, right? You know, I can pick them up for 40 bucks at a reptile show in Hamburg. Um, so, uh, so that's how I started with them. And they come in all kinds of colors, uh, you know, right. every color, super cool. Um, you know, so I bought a, a really, you know, ugly patterned yellow male named mm -hmm. Oscar, you know, and I kept him alive <laughs> for like three years until I killed him. <laughs> like, um, but, you know, as, as, uh, as I kept him, I realized I really liked their personalities and, you know, then I decided at some point I needed to have, you know, at least one of every color and pattern and face, <laughs> which is pretty impossible with Amazon. Tree You're close, though. You're I'm, close. I'm working on it. Yeah. I'm <laughs> on it. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. Oh, I so Randy, uh, right. we had you on recently, but uh, yeah, I'll just go over a brief quick synopsis. Little... Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you guys heard before, but the reason I got into Amazon is a little bit different. I started off with uh, green tree pythons and I was uh, head over heels for green tree pythons. 
but I was tired of selling, you know, raising and establishing these animals and then selling them to people who couldn't really figure it out. And yeah. even though I was coaching them through it, they're still having a hard time. So I wanted something that had kind of a similar aesthetics to it, uh, but maybe it was a little bit hardier and easier to take care of. So I started gravitating towards the Amazon tree boa. Um, you know, I was talking to Nick Mutton about, you know, just different species and stuff. And I picked up a pair from him in like mm, 2012 or something like that. And I just didn't think anything of it. You know, they were cool, uh, but it, the, the chondros really did it for me uh, until I started realizing that every color an Amazon tree boa comes in is a color that the green tree python community has sought after for generations <laughs> yeah, and they can't really. achieve. <laughs> so I just, it's almost like a complete 180, you know, I've just started going the opposite direction and I just fell head over heels for uh, Amazon tree boas and the different colors. And I'm probably going to get rid of most of my green tree pythons. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, need, I need the room. <laughs> Dude, hell yeah, hell yeah. Oh, hey, Rory. Yeah, yeah, right. however, however that works <laughs> yeah the mirror thing yeah <laughs> well like my man jake up there it was the patternless reds yep. yes yeah Just being being a young teenager uh stopping into my local reptile shop one day uh shout out to amazon reptile center in montclair california yeah. they had a huge vivarium store display and I think I'm probably 14 or 15 years old at the time, or early 2000s. Wow, I grew um, up in Montclair. That's oh, I'm sorry. Who was that? That was me. Randy. Sorry, I wasn't trying to cut you off. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no, no. no. I wasn't area. looking at the screen. <laughs> yeah. you, you grew no, up no continue. I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to cut you off. But I'll <laughs> no, talk of to you about it later. <laughs> we'll have a lot to talk about, I guess. Sure. <laughs> um, I see these little neon patternless red-orange uh snakes in this vivarium and at first i kind of oh you know took a look at them shrugged my shoulders and kind of mistook them in my mind for uh emeralds thinking mm. yeah those are little you know brightly colored neon orange baby snakes but you know they're just gonna grow up and kind of turn green and plain um flash forward um i started keeping you know snakes kind of in earnest um, I started collecting, uh, mostly carpet pythons at first when I started to get kind of serious into reptiles, but in the back of my mind, I always had this like image of that vivarium that I remember yeah. seeing in the pet store. And so hunting through the internet, I came across photos of other patternless kind of red, orange Amazons, and then realized, wait, these aren't like emerald tree boas they <laughs> stay this insane unreasonably bright red orange color as adults okay you know i'm i'm sold i have yeah. to track one of these things. <laughs> I, I have to track one down yeah uh but in those days um they weren't easy to come by uh not not captive bred ones anyways and you know not quite to the quality that i had been you know exposed to at that point um so it was always something that i kind of like sought after for the first few years um and around 2006 2007 i had my first opportunity uh to buy some really nice specimens uh captive bred from a keeper outside of uh, san francisco area um and once i got those things in my hand it, it was a foregone conclusion that that's what I was going to specialize yeah. in. I started, I started selling the carpet pythons. Um, I was, I was keeping gargoyle geckos, crested geckos at the same time. And, you know, as, as soon as the Amazon collection began to grow, you know, everything else was, was forced out. Um, and it's kind of been like that ever since. <laughs> Every rachidactylid enclosure is a new Amazon enclosure. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> that's tight dude that's awesome uh so down to dayton um in 2007 i was looking to get back into the hobby and um one thing i had never done before was like i had never bred animals i had just had a collection um you know of random species mm -hmm. and so one one of the things i wanted to do was 
produce my own animals. Um, and I also wanted to get involved with a species that um, I could get on like sort of like in on the ground level mm-hmm. um, that was sort of obscure or hard to keep. Um, and a lot of people weren't working with. Um, and I'd always been really fascinated with emerald tree boas, but uh, I was pretty intimidated by them. <laughs> uh, I it's just <laughs> intimidated by like, uh, I don't know. At that point, you know, everything I could find is they're very hard to keep and yeah. establish and and stuff like that. And they were decently expensive. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't uh, want to go that route. But um, in my research, I stumbled across a Halloween Amazon tree boa. And... Uh, you know, it was, I don't know. They had the, the cool look of an emerald tree boa because they're related, obviously. Um, and, and none of the uh, downsides, it seemed. And also, I'd never seen an animal with the crazy color and pattern of a, of a Halloween Amazon tree boa. Mm. Um, yeah. So I was sold and uh, <laughs> got my first one for, I don't know, like 100, 100 bucks or something like that. <laughs> Right, and then I, I, think... I started filling up my bedroom in my parents' house with it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think that that accessibility for Amazon's is such like an undertap part of the reptile market, because you know you look at green tree pythons and the barrier for entry is pretty high. Like even you know back in the day, at least you know three hundred dollars for a biak, and then now as things have become more and uh, more uncommon it, the price has just gone up and up and up whereas you know you can still get amazons for a hundred bucks a lot of the time uh or so less for, or <laughs> less i'm trying to give them you know hey their dues uh, true, uh, true. <laughs> they they uh for someone who's interested in getting into an arboreal they're a little bit hardier uh they come in a, a wider palette of colors and then that that price for entry is lower so people can get one see if it, if they like it and then if they do like it go further in and see all the different options that are available so i don't know i don't know if ian can unmute but if he can let's see let's hear it how you got into amazons what drew you to him i, I think yeah. he can this time there we go yeah i think we're good now you guys you're married yep. yeah <laughs> yeah yes sir all right um so how did i get into amazons well <clears throat> um it kind of came from from the green tree python side is where I really started it with the boreals. I had a pretty diverse collection prior to, to getting into green trees. And when I made the leap into a boreals, I went like full bore, like single species. Everything was green trees, the entire collection. And I did that until I really felt like I had things kind of dialed in. And then at that point, I wanted diversity like as soon as possible and mm. so i already had everything set up for boreals and i looked to what's what's the next species that i could work with that was similar in terms of care and caging and setup but something different and kind of to I, I don't know if it was rob or dayton said it like color palette right like amazon yeah. give you everything that green trees don't or at least mm. they give you adults what green trees only give you in juveniles right yes so it went from every single cage had a green tree python in it, the entire collection to, you know, like, what can I do that's different but similar? And um, I think around that time started picking Rory's brain and, and Dayton as well and got the chance to visit with Rory when I was out in California one time. And I just was hooked, man. Like, I think the, the first time I saw some of Rory's calicos in, in person, I was hooked. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you remember that, Rory. I was, like, drooling over those things. Oh, I remember. <laughs> the, ones, the, the really nice ones are over my dad, like, whatever. These are the ones that, like, I'm trying to breed away from this look. And I was just like, why? Like, these are awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, I was like, I absolutely remember because I stood there <laughs> proud and tall. <laughs> <laughs> and so now I got so damn many of these things. Like, it's, it's crazy. But um, I'm really attracted to, like, the... Like the patternless color the animals, the the orange, the yellow, the red, the calico. I like a lot of the the you know the calicos that have the black in them. 
Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know. I like them all. <laughs> Problem. The Tiger, Leopards. There's just so many different choices. And um, it's just they're they're kind of a nice balance to the green trees. And so, uh, you know, the, the boa side of the collection has, has grown over the last, I would say, probably <laughs> five years. I've uh, been lucky enough to be successful breeding them as well. So, um, yeah, that's how I got into them. Hell, Hell yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. So, I th oh, were you going to say something, Rob? No, no. Oh, okay, okay, cool. Um, so one of the things that I think that's really special about this particular scenario here for us all is the fact that uh, we're all keeping the species, but we're all in very different parts of the country. So <clears throat> for anybody that really knows keeping reptiles, uh, if you're living in New England trying to breed a species versus living in Southern California trying to breed a species, you might deal with different things dealing with husbandry and your breeding cycles so um i'd love to uh, get from you guys like what are some of the things that you're doing husbandry wise that have been incredibly successful and maybe some of the things that you've had to like retool over the years working with the species and and that can certainly bleed into uh breeding aspects um what are some of the things that you found super successful for you that uh some of the others uh, here might be like nope that wouldn't work for me one bit um you know how just find those those little minute things and this time we'll, we'll start with ian since he missed so much <laughs> so I, I guess um like two things come to mind for me uh one is the importance of heat for gravid females so i think i found out pretty early on um i had some females that just like I lost when they were gravid or just slugged out on me. And I think I was used to treating them more like green trees. And I had them in some tub racks that were lower down. And uh, I just learned real quickly after that, like gravid females really need to be able to bask. And, um, and so that was a hard lesson that I learned. But as keepers, sometimes, you know, you learn more from your failures and you do your successes. So that was... That was a hard one early on that I learned. Um, I think probably the second lesson with Amazons that I've learned is they're they're almost as easy to miss sex as green tree pythons. Yeah. <laughs> so I got <laughs> that I probed male like three times, and it, I was like, "Why are these two not hooking up?" And I threw it in with a male, and I'm like, "One of Rory's males, actually." And I'm like, "Son of a bitch!" Like, no, I was a female, even though I've had the thing for like five years now, and. Uh, <laughs> So that I would say that's probably the second thing, and uh, and probably the third thing is they really even though like I'm used to uh, green trees coming into arboreals, and I think a lot of people think of other arboreal species as acting like green trees. You know, emeralds probably you know the, the closest, but I, I think Rory, you once described them as like you know like oversized corn snakes or something like that. To arboreal me. corn snakes. Arboreal corn snakes. <laughs> that's what it was. Because like, you know, the thing that I learned real quickly is they really like hides. And I remember mm -hmm. when I went to, to see you, Rory, I, I, I think maybe I went to see you twice. I don't remember, but you had just gotten these cork tubes and maybe you didn't have them the first time you had them the second time or whatever. And you're like, now I just have tubs with cork tubes in them. I don't have <laughs> Oh, yeah. It's so true. Yep. But, like I, all of my Amazons that I keep, you know, uh, set up in big tubs, the adults, like, They've got they've got ground hides. They've got arboreal hides. Like they just they like hides. I mean, at night they're all over the place. They're they're cruising. They're they're out and about. But during the day they just they the importance of hides. Like everyone says, like okay, well they don't perch like a chondro. Instead of straight perches, they need crisscrosses or you know bent perches. But I don't I don't feel like they use the perches very much at all. I mean, they want the hide. They want to be in something or <clears throat> something. And quite frankly, I they use the ground hides a lot. So mm -hmm. all of mine have ground hides, and I find that they they kind of go back and forth between them. They have a little bit of a routine. So I would say those are probably three lessons that I learned. Female gravid females gotta have heat all the time. <clears throat> you know um, that don't don't think you know what sex they are until they've produced and they're perfect <laughs> because they might be what you think they are. And, and lots of hides, both arboreal hides and, and and ground hides. Heck yeah! How about how about you, Dayton? Um, I would just say, and I, I, I mean, like, I, 
I'm not really going to, uh, I wasn't planning on going into like the specifics of how I have my setup or anything or, or yeah. what I keep. And I can, if you guys ask questions, it's not a problem. Um, but I would say like the way that all of us probably keep our snakes is different. Mm-hmm. Um, and that doesn't make it like more or less successful. You, you kind of need to find what works for your area um where you're at you know your room your needs um but when you do find what works for the animal keep it the same yeah and and let them settle into that um i I went through you know different phases um and i still find the urge to do that sometimes where i'll see something and i'm like man that's really cool i should try that and i'll do it in all my cages and then you know, a few, <laughs> yeah, a few, a few months into it, I'll find out. I'm like, ah, this shit sucks. Or, you know, th- this is why I, I don't want to do this, you know, and then I'll take it all out. You know? And, and uh, so there was a lot of that early on. Yeah. Um, and I think that puts a lot of unnecessary stress on your animals. Um, so when you do meet their needs, you know, like you don't want them having bad sheds and stuff like that. And, uh, you don't want them spending, you know, all their time in one area, you know, things like that. You want them eating, <clears throat> reproducing. And uh, when you find out what works, keep it that way. Let them adjust and uh, just keep rolling with it. Um, yeah. One of the things I do differently, I think, than a lot of people is um, I just do ambient heat. Um, that might not be... Um, that was definitely very uncommon when I first started, um, mm-hmm. but it was really what worked for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just kind of how it grew. And now I have a room that is the snake room um, and it's got ambient heat in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do provide supplemental heat for my gravid females. Like Ian said, I think that's very important. Um, yeah. Hell yeah. That's where it's at. Heck yeah. Oh, All so right. now we're oh. gonna head. Yeah, we'll head o- over to you, Rory. Well, let's see. I echo uh, a <clears throat> lot of those previous sentiments. Um, really, when it comes to breeding, um, my personal journey with it has been all about just determining, you know, what the cycle for your geographical location is going to be like in terms mm-hmm. of, you know, weather patterns and seasonal changes. Um, I do not take. Uh, any specific steps, uh, steps to cool my animals, to cycle them through the seasons. Um, I try to maintain the, the snake room at a, a, I don't like it to get below like, you know, say 75 to 78 in the, in the winter time. So I do keep a small space heater. Um, and in the summertime, I let the room get between 82 or so it can get 84 degrees. Um, I found within that range, uh, they're still very aware of what the seasonal changes like, um, you know, outside, just within that, you know, five to 10 degree kind of temperature fluctuation. And so kind of early on, um, I was just taking more of like a shotgun approach to my breeding, um, you know, kind of thinking, well, it's <clears throat> it's cool season, it's the breeding season, let's start making introductions and uh, you know, recording every lock, um, you know, let's, oh, what is this little bit of swelling? That must be an ovulation. And you can kind of <laughs> drive yourself crazy uh, yes. in, those, yeah. in those early days, <laughs> trying to interpret like every little sign and force the breeding behavior. Um, but, it, it, and I got some <laughs> really kind of comically noobish results uh, in those first few years with like, Uh, thinking my animals were gestating for like nine months because uh, the initial swelling I observed Mm. was mistaken as a, as an ovulation because a shed came, you know, sometime kind of afterwards. But the more I kind of narrowed it down over my first few seasons, I really came to the determination that um, everything for my area here in Southern California liked to ovulate for the most part between like May and July. And I would get babies September through November for the most part. Mm -hmm. Um, And then just kind of backwards calculating, uh, 
and taking into account like the actual gestation period average being like around 130 or so days um yeah. i realized that man i'm pushing my males for like six months sometimes <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you know i don't know if, if it was just intuition or you know you get lazy sometimes but eventually my approach just became to observe the females and say hey you know she looks kind of thick and maybe let's throw a male in and see what happens mm -hmm. and sure enough you get you know a single lock or two over you know over a day two days at a time and boom you get an ovulation shortly afterwards and you get a beautiful healthy litter usually with uh minimal slugs um so one of my main kind of takeaways and bits of advice when it comes to breeding amazons is um uh you know you don't have to overbreed your males they don't they don't have to be breeding non-stop for months on end you can introduce them you know just to kind of gauge the situation and see how receptive either of them are um mm -hmm. however you know aside from that uh if you really want you know to be efficient about it um it's just all about timing the the female cycle you really only need one or two solid locks to get a healthy litter hell yeah heck yeah. can i can i add, add something real quick yeah yeah it's, absolutely. It, it's semi related to what rory was saying um these like you got to keep in mind these are not ball pythons so you're not going to have like one male fertilize 10 females yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know Damn it! Um, <laughs> like, in my opinion, and, and also the compat the compatibility issue. I have had pairs that like refuse to court each other yep. um, for years, and the second I introduce another male to that female, they will lock up. You know that that night. Um, so I I do think it's it's a good idea to have uh, a, a very similar male to female ratio. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. I agree. Here, here. <clears throat> yeah. So as long as Rory's finished up, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I'm the way I kept um, is was a little similar to you know green tree pythons because that's kind of where I came from, uh, just with the minor kind of adjustments with perching and um, but same. I you know I keep how Dayton does. I keep ambient my room. I have like a modified shed that has a full light door on the front and a window in it. So I can kind of uh, do an air exchange really quick in there and change the temperature really fast if I needed to. Uh, and then I have heat and it's really well insulated. Uh, so the room stays between, you know, 77 and 82 pretty much all year round. Uh, and I just keep them there. Um, it seems like everyone's pretty happy within those cooler temperatures. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of movement. Uh, I do like to see my animals. Um, when they're younger, I do provide hides. But as they get older, I do remove those. Sometimes I'll keep a cork tube in there. Uh, but I noticed that uh, I see mo much more perching with natural uh, branches than any of the plastic stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, these guys have more experience too. Maybe it's just my sample size. Um, but yeah, um, you know, just making ad minor adjustments like Eugene Bissett said, you know, you just got to be a student of the, the serpent. Mm -hmm. Just kind of watch yeah. them. They'll, they'll tell you what's going on. You know, if you see a female swelling up and you know you haven't fed her in a while or you know she's on the opposite end of the cage and you haven't seen her over there in a while just just start taking notes of those things and uh you know that's that's kind of how i take approach to any species that i work with uh i i think it was kind of funny in the beginning i remember reaching out to dayton because uh you know his reds were one of the first ones that i i reached out and i i had to get some of those uh <laughs> but i was like dayton what is wrong like i have these pinkies and I have this super hot, you know, water and some chick down and I can't get this thing to eat. And he's like, mm -hmm. what are you talking about? He's like, it fed frozen thawed fuzzies for me. No problem. You know, if you have a problem, like brain it a little bit. And it's mm -hmm. just those slight different variations, you know, within the ways we do things is there, there's little recipes here and there that, uh, you know, you just need to pick up on. But yeah, as soon as I tried that or tried to wrap pup, you know, it, or uh, rat pinky it was on like Donkey Kong, you know. So it's just little things that you got to tweak, you know. Up here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, when it's warm out, we don't really have to mist and stuff like that. But 
Uh, as it gets cooler, I like to keep the window cracked anyway, so it sucks the moisture out. So I do have to, I like to keep them on cypress mulch and I, I spray it down, you know, at least once a week or something like that. So, Hell yeah. yeah and, and just like everyone else, you know, keep pretty, pretty similar, uh, same sizes, chondro cages and uh, rack systems and stuff like that. So. Hell yeah. I'll echo that. Uh, I've noticed that if you give them those smooth perches or PVC perches, mm -hmm. they don't, yeah, they don't tend to gravitate happen. towards those yeah, as opposed I think it's to the texture, texture thing stuff. Or, or, yeah. or what, but you know, I just kind of leave my animals alone. I, I'm more of an observant keeper than, you know, handling and stuff, but the Amazons I really do like to handle uh, when I do want to take a snake out. But I think they just know that when I go in there that I'm not always going to, you know, mess around with them. So yeah. most of them are out perched most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Which is cool. I definitely like going down in my <laughs> repel room and seeing them perched up and, and out. It's definitely cool <laughs> to see that. Yeah. All right. We'll head down to Noah. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of the same stuff that everybody else said. I, I think consistency, I think Dayton hit on consistency yeah. is the key. Mm -hmm. I, I do not keep ambient. I can't. I, I finished my garage. I put a mini split in it and an insulated garage door. And I'm in the Northeast. I'm in Pennsylvania. It gets cold here, right? So yeah. not quite New England cold, <laughs> but um, <Quite> cold. <laughs> you know, this garage, even with that mini split running uh, full steam ahead when it's 20 degrees outside does you know, can get down to like 62 over near the garage door and 67 over, you know, where the snakes are. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, they seem to deal with it just fine. <laughs> like that said, I have heat panels or, or, um, heat tape under every tub, heat, heat cable, whatever, whatever rack system I have going with the snake that's in it or yeah. cage. Um, you know, so they all have heat all year round. I try to keep the hot spots, you know, between 85 and 90 all year. I, playing around with things just gets me in trouble. Like at the beginning <laughs> of uh, learning, learning how to keep these things, you know, I did it all wrong, right? I bought the $40 something from the Hamburg show that had mites and, you know, all kinds of stuff and had to figure it out and spend all kinds of money figuring it out. Then respiratory infections and vet bills and all the other things. So, you know, buy quality animals, number one. <laughs> um, otherwise, you just spend as much money anyway, figuring out how to yeah. keep less <laughs> quality animals alive or more. <clears throat> yeah. um, but, you know, consistency. When those, when those animals um, would get sick, I would think, oh, it's my husbandry. It's something I'm doing wrong. I need to keep them warmer. I'm too hot. I got to go colder. And, you know up and down and up and down for years until I realized, well, it's not that it's just that I bought, um, sickly animals from a show. This is <laughs> happening to all the sickly animals. Right. Yeah. So when, once I realized that you just be confident and once you dial it in, leave it, leave it alone. <laughs> like I, <Yes>. I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I keep, I try to keep all my ambience between 75 and 80 and hot spots between 85 and 90 and then leave it be. If the corner of the cage gets to 65 degrees and the snake wants to go there for whatever reason, um, it will. And, and if it's too cold, it'll go to the hot spot. Right. I mean, end of story. They're not, they're not, um, they're smart. They'll, they know what they need, so they'll get it. <laughs> like, they'll go to what they need. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I keep, uh, I keep, cork tubes in all my cages um one on the floor one in the in the branches i have a lot of pvc cages that i'll just like you know put one of the pvc perches through a cork tube and that's up high the the snaker will sit in that cork tube or on top of it you know i, I think the perching thing they just need to feel like their whole body is supported they don't want to perch like an emerald although sometimes they do they do you know? yeah yeah um but uh you know in some of these cages I'll, I'll zip tie like that uh garden mesh between perches right just create mm -hmm. like a little basket and it's plastic it's not natural whatever but they'll perch they'll perch on something like that um whereas they won't just perch on on the pvc perch itself um you know, as far as, as 
breeding goes, I wish I had it as dialed in as Rory where I could just introduce him once and watch him lock and then just be done. With the <laughs> <season>. <laughs> like, I'm not that good. Right. So, um, I, uh, I generally, it, it seems I, I start in March. I start, um, you know, uh, putting my males with my females. Occasionally I'll do, you know, a January pairing, just to see what happens. I actually did my, uh, Passat hypos this January, and that female's looking super dark, ready to hopefully give me a post ovulation shed. Nice. Um, but you know, I just pair them for you know three or four days. I'll separate them if somebody needs fed. The females I try to feed heavy during um, the March to about you know May, June, or whenever whenever they ovulate or where I know they are pregnant. Um, and then, uh, then I'll back off the smaller meals every couple weeks. Um, you know, but just consistency is, is the key every week. I'm pairing them for three, four days, separate them, um, you know, feed the females, put them back together the next week. And it just seems to work every, every year. Sometimes they'll, We'll give birth in August. August to November is is about when I'm when I'm getting babies with that uh, that program. <laughs> Hell yeah, man! That's where it's at. Heck yeah! Oh, All right, right Jake. Well, <laughs> I would just say you know that everybody seems to have their own way to do it, and there's no wrong way if you don't have sick animals. Um. If you're not keeping your temperature up or your humidity where it needs to be for the species, then you can have problems, obviously. So I'm an ambient air guy. I like 80 to 84 degrees. Um, Thermoregulation occurs naturally from one end of the tub to the next or one end of the container to the next. Um, I offer supplemental heating to gravid females. And that was based off of a model that Rory used. Um, he was kind enough to tell me what he used for supplemental heating. And I've done it and replicated it. And it's worked out pretty good for me. Um, I would just say, you know, don't be surprised if an animal doesn't lock up. Or you don't see or witness the animal lock up. Yeah. But then you see a swelling or something, and then there's a shed, and then there's a, a difference in behavior, and you can pretty much tell if you're in your snake room at least a few days a week, cleaning, maintaining, feeding, you get a rhythm for the cycles that your animals are on. You know when this one's going to shed or when it's going to, when it's hungry. You know, I've yeah. got I've got a male that he eats every third time I try to feed him, you know, he's just a picky (laughs) guy, you know, but that's, that's him. Then every one of my other animals eats once a week. And Mm -hmm. I have a remarkable amount of Amazons that will not bite you. They will get close to you and I can stick my hand in when one's sleeping, pick it up. You know, it might hiss it might expel some urates or something, but other than that, they don't bite. I've got about three animals that do bite, and I wear gloves when I handle them because I'm starting to get older, and I'm I don't like to get bit in my fingers. Yeah, for real. Yeah, <laughs> nobody nobody likes a finger bite. Man. No, <laughs> yeah, I mean it's just it's uncomfortable. So, you know, but I don't. There again, I don't handle my animals on a daily basis. I mm-hmm. I've picked that liger up I think two or three times just to look at how amazing that animal is and just to appreciate it. And then I put him back, you know, and I'm like, okay, you need, you need some humidity. So I break out the spray bottle, you know, Mm -hmm. and, um, I keep my room with ambient heat, like I said, and I just, I spray maybe once every two days, you know, I got a, I got a big backpack sprayer. This is a tip for you. Get a big backpack sprayer, what? and then you can you can just hold a wand <laughs> and crank the pump, 
and stick it into one of the air holes of the container and spray, <laughs> spray, spray. <laughs> <laughs> Work smarter, not harder, right? Hey, man, when you're doing this all day, it's like milking a cow, you know? I mean, I'm not Amish. So you're used I'm, to I'm it. A, Don't I'm, not, hey, I'm, not, I'm not doing it, man. <laughs> but the forearms you get, man. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> so that, it's oh, it's God. it's... It can be it can be confusing at first, but once, like Noah mm. said, once you get things dialed in, keep it. Oh, oh, did we we lost him. That's what he gets for using the backpacks for. <laughs> let, let me jump. <laughs> let me <laughs> nerd. Let me <laughs> let me jump yeah, on there we go. There we go. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we there go. We go. Mm -hmm. No, just keep just keep it simple. You know, don't don't overthink things. Um, That's a big just one. A, Oh, 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 there he oh, goes again. Goodness. Let me let me jump on his Amazon's don't bite thing. Yeah. So I have probably <laughs> I don't know a hundred um, snakes. Oh, there he is again. That's okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. sorry. My bad. No, you're good. You're good. I, I have about a hundred snakes in here, Amazon's, um, and I would say probably ninety five of them are. They're all alert, but. There's a few of them that are babies. They're they're tamer than ball pythons, um, but mm. 95 of them won't bite me. <laughs> like, yep. And then yeah. I got a couple couple jerks. But yeah, I, I mean, maybe really I'm looking around and thinking to myself, it's like three three that I know will bite me anytime. Yeah. But out, out of a hundred, <laughs> like yeah. these things are not anywhere near as aggressive as most people think they are. No, I tell people all the time, I think the better way to describe them is like a, they're a nervous snake. They have like anxiety. They're always like, what's, what's going on, you know? But once yeah. after that, you know, they, they're really calm. Like I'd rather handle my Amazons than my green trees. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that should just be yeah. a normal <clears throat> desire. Rain. Yeah. Period. <laughs> <laughs> Mic drop. I'm out. <laughs> Most of mine are dickheads, but yeah. I don't really. <laughs> I don't put a lot of effort in there into that relationship. Either, you know, so. Jaden's like, I'm there with my hand sprayer. We keep it <laughs> He's jaded. Don't let the court. <laughs> I remember years ago, Dayton coming up to me when I first had my first chondro clutch, and he was telling me, he's like, I'm going to have the best reds in the country. You just watch. Then mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. like, what, 2011 or something like that? 2012? Maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Damn. Yeah, yeah Rand, I agree with you though. Like, you know, I, I think it's sort of like import Bioc green tree pythons, right? Like, uh -huh. Rand in a cage with an import Bioc. Doesn't matter if it's been in this country for five years. Usually they're just jerks and yep. they have good reason to, right? They hate right. They probably should. But they should. Same Bioc mm -hmm. and it's two generations captive bred and their puppy dog tame. They're fine. Yeah. So I think a yeah. lot of it is. The, the stigma that Amazons get is because most people are used to that $50 snake at a show that's in a 10-gallon tank with 20 yes. others. Yeah. <laughs> this thing eight humans, and again, mm -hmm. they should because they've had a Deserve. long Suriname or Guyana or, you know, wherever they came through. But, uh, and, and to what Jacob said, um, you know, I think it, w what you hit on there, it sounds to me like what Keith McPeak always preaches, right? Like rhythm of the room, like mm -hmm. rhythm of the room. Mm -hmm. And once yeah. you get that rhythm, you just stick with it and you got to know, you know, kind of what to expect. And you got to read your animals. And, you know, Keith was a big influence on me when I was getting into Amazons also. And he keeps ambient like like some of you guys do. And um, and I don't. And so that was part of you know the learning curve, too, is understanding that difference. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, but those guys like Keith, rhythm of the room, Eugene Bissett, student of the serpent. You just got to mm -hmm. know your animals and all those different regions that we all live in. I mean, it's all different, right? Like there's no one way yeah. to do it. Um, right. You know, I don't know. Maybe backpack sprayer is the one way to do it. But <laughs> not, not go in, I just, go I in. Say... I know, I know some supports coming my way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think that's so true. And I, I'm, I, I love that line from Eugene, be a student of the serpent, man. Cause it, it's, it's so true across the board. Right. You know, but yeah. I mean, we start talking about certain species that, you know, are already kind of these off to the distant 
species for for most people like one of those reasons is because they're not willing to spend that time to really look at it it's like oh i can just figure it out as a ball python or a corn snake mm -hmm. or whatever i can just look at the thing from a hundred yards away and know what's going on with it you know and and amazon's definitely take a little bit more of that attention to detail and there's def certainly many species that do so i i really think that 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 phrase is very very true in this context for sure um, before we continue, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to take a two minute break to run our sponsor ad really quick. So guys, just hang tight and we'll be back in two minutes. Black Box Cages, located in Buford, Georgia, is your one stop shop for all of your caging and rack needs. Owners Jen and Clint are at the helm of this fantastic company. With one of the shortest lead times in cage and rack manufacturing, Black Box can satisfy anyone's needs. From baby racks to V70s, arboreal and terrestrial caging to deep-fronted bioactive enclosures. You can find everything you need right here. New enclosure sizes and products are added frequently to their availability, so be sure to check back often. Black box cages have tons of customizing options for lighting and heating. Along with that, cages and racks can be stacked with metal stacking dowels, and all cage joints are datoed for improved durability and stability. Most cage units are flat packed, but are pre-assembled prior to shipping to ensure a solid build every time. The Micro, XC18, XT3, BioG, and 3-Stack V70 ship assembled, and all other racks are shipped freight and assembled. The XR16 and XR20 model racks allow keepers to mix and match tubs. Fitting both Vision and Freedom Breeder tubs, you can mix the V15, V18, and V35S tubs, or the FB5, FB8, and FB35CV SC tubs. This kind of flexibility allows keepers to raise their animals from hatchling to juvenile or sub-adult size before needing to upgrade into adult caging. Don't just take our word for it. Go to their website to see countless customer reviews and review videos from keepers all over. To learn more about Black Box Cages, follow them on Facebook and Instagram at Black Box Cages, and of course their website, www.blackboxcages.com. Links to their socials and website will be available in the podcast description. Bam's massive shout out to Black Box Cages for being our uh, continued sponsor. Um, go check out their website because they're always updating available inventory and coming out with new designs. So go check them out. Um, okay, so we've hey, talked. Hey, Jeremy and Rob. Yes. Hit, hit us with the hard stuff. Make us fight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I really did want to talk about uh, how. Uh, since Amazons are polygenic and a yes. lot of people just think that it's all a crapshoot when you breed them, all of the people in this, you know, this room here have had experience breeding Amazon tree boas and seeing litters. What sort of patterns have you guys seen? Uh, and do you think it's really as polygenic as uh, it's, it's kind of laid out to be? Fight! <laughs> <laughs> you guys want to start with like one gene in particular and like give our opinions on it or what? How do you want to do that? How, 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 like, okay, okay. I don't think just I want to see you can have, <laughs> hey, I don't think you can have a Stop colored them leopard. hypos and call them het Lucy's. <laughs> I don't think I you started. can have a red leopard. <laughs> yeah, hypo, dumbest name ever. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's random. Um, I think we're starting to figure out more and more, uh, like we've got a pretty good indicator of how garden is inherited um red calico tiger um we're still fighting on the on the hypo het hypo thing a little bit yeah. <laughs> um but if if you if you sort of uh, patterns aside if you just like break down the colors um red and garden those are kind of now garden comes in a couple different patterns you know like halloween and, mm -hmm. and then your your standard run of the mill garden, but garden, it's pretty much seems like it's recessive. Yep. Um, same with red and calico. Uh, maybe there's more to that than just um, the color. Uh, in my opinion, I think red and calico are the same thing, and it's a color. It's not a pattern mutation. Okay. Mm. Um, 
which is kind of why you if you have like a, a true red animal that's born red it develops it stays red you you almost can't separate the white from it like you can't have a, a true solid red fully red scaled you know amazon tree bow I, I don't think you can I, I don't think i've ever seen one hmm. um it can come close uh but not not quite um but you also you also see calicos that start out with the the white oscillations um you see calicos that are more random and speckled you see them with and without black pattern um I just think that that's sort of inseparable. Mm -hmm. Um, But then you can kind of break things down into like bicolor and tricolor, but that's really kind of just a matter of pattern and the amount of melanin the animal has. I I think that's pretty much the same thing. Um, And and I don't know how that's inherited. Uh, I don't know if anybody has anything to add to that. But I, I think, yeah, go ahead. That's, that's yeah. sort of like the base colors mm-hmm. that they come in, mm-hmm. you know? A- yeah. And we've got several pieces in place. So if, if you can make litters of, you know, full gardens, full red calicos, You've got a good, uh, you know, stepping stone to to jump off into the how those genes are inherited. Yeah. Hell yeah, yeah, I think you're right, Dayton. Well, this I wasn't very really fun. This wasn't a very fun fight. I was going to say, we're <laughs> I think, I think, I think that it's. The, I don't think this is a fight. I think I agree with Dayton mostly. The the calico thing, anyway. I I think the red, you know, any of these Amazons that are born red regardless of amount of pattern, you know, pattern less with a couple black scales, um, tons of pattern, crazy, crazy calicos that, you know, Rory has and makes, you know, freak show like Randy has. Um, those, those, the pattern is different. It's, it's a different thing. It, the, the red is anything. Red is what we're calling calico. Like, that's what I think we should yeah. be calling calico. I think that's what the recessive gene is. And then the pattern, the underlying pattern is is what makes them look different. You know, crazy, crazy, wild, or or completely patternless, or anything, anything completely in between. And I think that's a different thing, a different, different thing altogether. You know, mm. um, as far as as far as Calico goes, I mean, Rory and Dayton did all the work on that. <laughs> like, and and uh, they would There's be the plenty ones more to, to do. To that team. <laughs> I, I agree with that. There's still some pretty big questions. Despite uh, my consistency with the Reds and the Red Calicos, um, no, I've never even claimed to have the final word. Um, I've always been open to many different interpretations, although I do pretty much agree with everything that uh, Dayton outlined um, in terms of the simple recessive nature of probably most of the base color morphs, um, yellow garden phases, as well as kind of red shaded animals, they do all appear to be uh, inherited in a simple recessive manner. Um, I don't find that the genetics in general are are really random at all, of course. Um, I think the kind of the attribution of randomness with this species kind of comes just from the fact that I think many of our so-called wild type animals are essentially already the product of like multiple yes. morphs or color and pattern variations. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so what we have to do a lot is we're actually with reverse this species uh, reverse engineering mm-hmm. naturally occurring combination morphs to kind well of put. figure out the inheritance of the individual traits in question. Um, And then once you start to look at that uh, forward projected again, it just becomes rather confusing. Um, Again, just when trying to determine uh, the different types of patterns just within, say, red calicos. Why are some red calicos, um, you know, so consistently patterned with like the circular ocular pattern, whereas other red calicos are, you know, seemingly patternless with just a random speckling 
of, of off-colored scales to contrast one another. Um, also, one thing that I've always said regarding reds is um, there certainly are a lot of different expressions of red. You have animals yes. that are born orange that turn red. Mm -hmm. You have animals that are born red that turn orange. Um, Both of those, in my opinion, are are different. Yeah, I think I, they are not calicos. Yes. Okay. I, I, I yeah, I would t I would tend to agree. Um, the trouble for me in some of my pairings in the past has been um, I have a lot of strong genetics on both both family sides of some of these pairings uh, that tend to produce different types of reds. And there have been litters in the past where I've bred, you know, a high expression visual red calico to a red animal that's perhaps not, you know, for lack of a better term, a legitimate red. It's maybe more of a very dark reddish orange type animal. And within that litter, it might appear at face value to be 100% red, maybe even 100% red calico. However, with age and several years of maturity, it becomes very easy to um, kind of pick the, in my opinion, the true, what were the true calicos versus some of the other red formed animals that might also just happen to have some amount of white or lighter red, pink kind of off shade uh, highlights to them. I actually just had a pair reproduce or produce offspring that would fit that description exactly. And I have no fucking idea what they are. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we love They're all really kick-ass, brightly colored red. <laughs> but I, there are a few of them that have orange stripes. So I, I'm thinking those are not. Those are more the red-orange. Exactly. There you go. Um, but I'm not sure of the ones that don't have. Because then I've got some that are black-striped. And uh, I don't really have any that are like solid white stripes. Um, so yeah, I'm just confused. And go, yeah, kind of my original contention with red calicos before I even started to breed them um, was that we might just be looking at some combination of genes that has a very specific look uh, when combined with each other that within other color phases either, you know, doesn't. Like, for example, of, of course, we don't see an equivalent yellow calico or an equivalent orange calico, um, which kind of, as Dayton uh, said, you know, might be a good argument towards, well, maybe it's the same as maybe it is just a red mutation and there's just natural variability amongst it. Um, but um Oh, I lost my train of thought. Even th trying to think about it, <laughs> uh, I, I think I think it's kind of like a, a leopard. You know, everybody wants to see a colored leopard instead of the black and silver, or the brown and black, or you know, everybody wants to see a colored leopard. And I think you know, I've seen pictures of animals that resemble what you might think is a colored leopard, but has it been proven? No, Cody Joe had that really sick looking orange thing that was like somebody called it a dream sickle leopard i mean hmm. you know that's that's the idea of a leopard but is it a true leopard i don't think so i don't think that and, and it's yet to be proven but i don't think that a leopard can take on another color unless maybe you did some sort of weird het lucy hypo breeding to uh, a leopard and you got a combination i don't know if one would rule the other one out uh genetically or not but um and there again leopards recessive so you know it takes multiple generations to prove this stuff out and i think dayton and rory have done quite a bit of of good for the species in these breedings and ian is is popping out some nice babies but you know, where are we going with this as a whole? Are we trying to produce different morphs? Are we trying to figure out the morphs? Are we agreeing on the inheritance of the morphs? Are, are the morphs more important than a normal ATB? I don't think so. I think everybody has their own boat to float. And I think we've all got good ideas that are in play 
And as time goes on, we'll prove more and more out about the species and things will be nailed together a little bit better than what they are currently. So it's a matter of time. Uh, it's a matter of some perspective. I think it's a matter of um, breedings. And NOAA is set up to be doing some major breeding in the coming years, which excites me because I want to see an albino Amazon tree boa. Get to that, breeding, guys. That's <laughs> what I want to see. Well, you know, if yeah. you what, what Rory said, actually, like, that kind of resonates with me. Like, you know, we're, we're trying to do the, the inbreeding. Right? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> you are in Florida, Ian. <laughs> God. Like, you know, Florida man strikes again. <laughs> but what you're talking about there, I mean, I don't want to make comparisons to ball pythons, but I mean, that's essentially what the ball python community has done, right? Like over the right. last two years, they've reverse engineered yeah. what went yeah. to make all of those quote unquote normals, right? Out of Africa. Yeah that had just these little tiny markers that people were able to figure out, you know, how to peel it apart to make, you know, every morph under the sun. So in a way, you know, yeah, those, those quote unquote wild type gardens that come in and are 50 bucks at a show are kind of like a dinker, you know, ball Python that just came over from Africa. You, you really don't know what you're going to get. And um, I think that's part of what makes it so cool. And, I, and maybe it was Dayton who said it, but, Getting in at the ground floor, right? Like mm -hmm. you know, yep. we're figuring some stuff out. Yeah, we're we're figuring out that we don't understand some of it just as quickly as the stuff we do understand. I, I think for me, the sort of the the unicorn or the 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 ghost I feel like I'm chasing is this this het Lucy gene. I mean, it just to me <laughs> that's the one. You're not the only I one. Love, love the reds. I really like that, actually, and I like the red tigers especially. But the one that just makes me butt my head up against the wall is that that pet Lucy gene, and why we call it hypo is beyond me. And, you know, at, at first I kind of thought like, eh, whatever, it's not that big a thing. And then the, the, I've only seen one Lucy in person, and it was one of Chris McQuaid's animals I saw at Daytona. And ever since I saw that, all I want to do was make one. And, yep. And I just, I don't know, the whole post het hypo thing and. I've just I've got more yellow patternless snakes than I know what to do with, and I can't. <laughs> like. Can I, we rebrand them? Get, fire, you get, fire, you get, fire Amazon. Yeah. Us? Yes. There you go. Yeah. Head ivories. I don't care what we call it. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I think everyone needs to. You know, the people who are working with Amazons. You know, there's all these cool established morphs already, but they should maybe set aside a dinker project here and there to kind of see what's going on because there's there's a lot of things that haven't been proven out yet you know uh like we like uh dayton and roy are saying like there hasn't been any yellow or orange calicos there's been animals that uh, look well, close there, there might well so there right, might, right. So, yeah, there, there right. might be <laughs> sure right but so we need to prove I'm this working out on it <laughs> yeah. yeah and i mean i have yellow animals amazons that look like they have a similar aesthetic but it, you, we could be breeding those thinking it's a yellow calico and then all of a sudden we just realize it's a granite gene or it's an increasing melanin gene uh, and it takes us in a different direction but at least these little dinker projects will help us kind of figure those things out mm -hmm. rory have so you the, made have oh, you made a lucy with your lucy no i have not i have I have struck out on is every your, pairing. Is your I've Lucy attempted. a female? Have, have no, no he's a male. Okay. Have you paired it back to one of its offspring? No. No. I know the hypo term came from the originator of the the Lucy, and that was Chris McQuaid. Yeah. So back in, I think it was 2010, I bought what was a male hypo from chris mcquade he advertised it on king snake um i paid a lot of money for it got it looked at it said yeah this is cool um uh, i want a female so he pulls a female i get it maybe six months later um i i don't know what i'm looking at other than a, a really a really pale yellow snake with blue eyes, green eyes, or yellow eyes, depending upon which which one I had. I had some that had 
blue eyes. I had some that had green eyes. I had some that had yellow eyes. Um, I think I had four or five hypo het Lucy's from Chris McQuaid. The first pairing I ever did with my hypo male, het Lucy male, was to a garden phase. And I got seven crazy looking yellows, three tigers, and that no gardens. No gardens at all. Second pairing I did with him was to hit the Het Lucy female, and I proved them out because they had a stillborn Lucy. I was staring at five babies, f screaming yellows, and a stillborn Lucy that had its guts. It was born with its guts outside his body. Damn. So, you know, I, I said, okay, it's, it's far, as far along as this female went with these babies, the Het Lucy had deep blue eyes, white snake, looked just like the Lucy's I had bought from Chris McQuaid, and there it was lying dead in a container. Um, I sold two of those hypos. I don't know where they went to. Um, somebody in Tennessee uh, got my got my male Lucy. Um, where, the, where they went to after that, I don't know. Um... I was going through a divorce, so things kind of took precedence, and I had to get my stuff, my shit in order, in line. So I figured, you know, I'll drop everything I'm doing and put everything into, you know, fixing this, this other problem that I'm glad is gone. You know, so <laughs> now I have now I have all the time in the world to focus on Amazon Tree Boas. And I tell you what, with everything I've got, I got some incredible plans ahead. So I got three pairings looking uh, next year, two Het Lucy pairings, a Tiger pairing, and then the following year I should have some Leopard, Het Leopard, um, Tiger, more Het Lucy stuff. Um, you know, I, I think there's... I'm not sure whether it's Het Lucy or Hypo because you look at certain animals that are that came from a leucistic and they have patterns. Um, I had a male Lucy that turned all the way brown. The only thing that wasn't brown was his eyes. Um, yeah. You know, it's 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 odd. There's there's some things occurring that are not really explainable. You know, you have to you've got to prove everything out, and that takes time. So. I'm glad to be back in it. I'm glad to be working with everybody that's here. I'm glad to be on the show. You know, Hell Dayton yeah. and Roy have been my go-to staples for animals. Um, I get quality. You know, I have to stress CBB. I have to stress CBB, captive, born, and bred. Yeah. It's great that we had the animals come in that Danny Mendez got that proved out the tiger. You know, it's great that the wild-caught animals come in, but if you want to start out, with a firm foundation, I think going captive bred and born is the way to go. Like Noah said earlier, you save yourself the vet bills, you save yeah. yourself the problems, you yeah. got healthy animals to start with, and that only increases as you learn um, more and more about the species and their needs. So, you know, that's that's what I got to say. Yeah. So, uh, I'm I'm team hypo on the on the hypo or head <laughs> hypo. Uh, discussion. Um, and I think based on the founding animals, it makes sense why he would call them hypo. And if you use other species as comparison, mm -hmm. um, all the other species that have leucistics, the single gene form is basically some form of hypo. It's a lighter animal. It's a less patterned animal like fireball pythons fire boa constrictors um they've got them with the reticulated pythons but like rory was saying earlier we're trying to reverse engineer these animals so when we outcross those single gene animals to animals that we don't fully understand what genes they're carrying mm -hmm. we're adding other genes that can mask mm -hmm. that and, mm -hmm. and it's a subtle gene because Amazon tree boas are super diverse and you're just saying like a lighter animal or a less melanistic animal, which can occur naturally anyway. Mm -hmm. it, it, you, you could be pairing it to something that uh, I think Randy mentioned like a IMG gene, which is 
increasing melanin. And that seems to be almost universal with Amazon tree boas. Like every Amazon tree boa increases melanin as it matures to some extent. <laughs> sure. Um, so if you take that hypo gene and you pair it, you outcross it to an unrelated animal, then you might introduce a gene like an IMG gene. And if you think of something like a hypo IMG boa, that that's not necessarily a hypo boa, right? Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. less melanistic than a full IMG. Okay. Just I mean, to, uh, go ahead, Roy. Yeah, just to clarify my perspective on hypo um, versus het hypo, um, I began referring to them as uh, het, het Lucy, I should say, um, simply because, again, for me, I was not able to, with 100% certainty, uh, pick out any potential uh, hypos or het Lucys within the litter. Um, but really, I just mean when I say... You know, when it, when it comes to the hypo versus het lucy is of course the target animal is the lucy the leucistic and that does appear to be homozygous so uh whether it's recessive or some incomplete form of dominance. co or incomplete dominance mm -hmm. it, it seems like the mode of inheritance is is the same mm -hmm. what do you guys think about the theory that some people have floated out there uh and I, i'm not going to name names but that the lucy gene is potentially a fatal gene and that's why we don't see more lucy's out there that most of them either are born stillborn or have you know issues thriving or you know just don't survive long term i mean i i've only seen one lucy in person mm -hmm. i don't know you know i mean in this group between dayton and rory maybe you guys have seen a few but you know like they're not out there with as many costs or het lucy whatever you want to call them like it seems like we can see more of them I know there's some fairly well-known breeders of other species and that work with them that floated the idea of a, a fatal gene um i don't think it's fatal because there are adult lucy's uh, but it's possible that it could be like near fatal or or unhealthy uh, it could be attached to something that that is causing the animals to die i've produced one leucistic animal and it died at about a year old was um, it a it strong was, feeder or it, it, it did start feeding rarely easy or okay. fairly easy for me um and about a year old it, it stopped it developed a mass really quickly and then it died hmm. um i i don't know why it died or anything like that but uh well, you're not supposed to let him die dean yeah Especially when he's <laughs> well, so there's, there's other things too that have you know lethal white snakes too right like jaguar yeah. carpet pythons yeah. and yeah. Yeah. pythons i mean so it's right. a possibility you know some of them can live for a small period of time that have maybe digestive problems or something that we didn't know was going on because we can't see it yeah, and that's. I was just gonna bring up something like the like the uh, the ticks, the retics, sure, uh, the nice. super fan retics and stuff. Where it's like sometimes you they'll live ten years and sure. then just and all of a sudden die. just an issue pops up and it's like gone. Wow, they can live that long. Rory's got the only one yeah. that's reproduced. <laughs> yeah, to my yeah, knowledge. Hmm. So maybe it's, it's also it's also the ugliest like, one in existence. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't look like a Lucy. <laughs> If what you guys saw a recent about, photo of it, I mean, Lucy would never cross your mind. Is it mainly gray now? or it's very dark gray, grayish, yeah. brownish, black. You need to post more on Instagram. We'd love to see that. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, Rory, what's wrong with you? Uh, no comment. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably smart. <laughs> but uh, other, yeah, I, I, I have no reason to believe that the, the Lucy gene... Um, is fatal not through my own experience if there is if i had to just take a guess at it and there is some form of health issues um it might not be attached to the lucy gene itself it could just be like an unwanted addition that was from the result of the necessary inbreeding that you know took place to establish the line at, at its yeah. founding certainly possible too so, so if there is an issue with them you know i hope it's not attached to the the lucy itself 
hopefully it's just unwanted baggage. I owned three of them that I bought from Chris. Two females and a male. One of the females died on me from a bowel obstruction at about a year old. The second female I had for two years, and no matter what she did, she would only eat rats, and she would only eat them like once every second or third time you offer them to her. Um, and the male I had, the one that gained all the the brown pigment, um, it was a, a fireball. It would eat it would eat anything you put in front of it. Um, very aggressive animal. And again, it went to a friend of mine in Tennessee's. Um, he knew what it was, even though you couldn't tell from looking at it that it was leucistic. It kind of like what Rory said about it. It was it was heavily brown, you know. As it, it I got it, it was speckled. It was white with speckled brown, and yeah, the brown that, just dominated. That that animal was overall quite white when when it was young, still. Correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. very white yeah. with just a handful of like kind of gray speckles. As is brown speckling from 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 its nose to its tail, it had random brown speckling and, and over time it, it just it took over. The leucistic that I produced was from a father daughter pairing. Um I do have a fairly outcrossed hypo to hypo pairing that I'm doing this year. Mm. Um so I am hoping for better results. Um, I I'm still pursuing it. Has she ovulated yet? Or she's actually swelling. She hasn't ov Sweet. ovulated yet, but uh, she has started swelling. Awesome! Heck yeah! What do you guys think about you know the the idea of hypo and het Lucy maybe being two genes and not necessarily one and the same? Because it seems like most of what you see now at <laughs> Het Lucy or, or Het possible hypo, you know, doesn't look like the traditional patternless yellow snakes that I've seen in the past. And, you know, I've got some that look like that and some that don't. And so I wonder, you know, myself, I've thought, well, maybe, they, maybe initially the Het Lucy's were also hypo, but over time that Het Lucy team has been outcrossed to animals that were not hypo. And so that maybe we're actually talking about two genes and not. Does that make sense? I think, I think if you can have a dirty Lucy, it stands to reason you can have a dirty Het Lucy. If the if the if the super form of the animal can have a certain amount of pigment on it, whatever color it is, it come it came in brown for me. I think looking at the hypo or Het Lucy, whichever term you want to call it. I'm undecided. You know, I think I see things in the hypo that 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 you can identify. I think I see things in the het Lucy that you can't identify, but it came from a Lucy. So, you know, if you can have a dirty leucistic that's not solid white, then you can have a dirty het Lucy hypo. I mean, I've seen some het Lucy or hypo pos hypo animals that almost look like they're bicolor. Right. right? Yeah. So most of them have a little bit of orange, like the the line that I think Dayton is working with. They have like towards the towards the vent and the tail. There's like a little swirly orange action going on. Yeah, and I, I've got some that are very dirty looking, but I've got some others that are from a different line that are from Bobby Pruitt that are just um, you know just solid yellow, just yeah. literally just a yellow snake. Dayton, yeah, do you think I, you can have... confidently reach, like, you can look at someone else's litter and pick out the hypos from there? Or do you think it's uh, just your sample size from actual breeding yellows to yellows? I think I, I, think I could. Um, I've, I've had, I've posted uh, pictures of siblings mm -hmm. side by side. Um, one being a hypo, one not being a hypo. I've also raised those same animals up into adulthood. And the only difference, like they're basically both patternless um, yellow. But if you look at the picture, they're two different colors. It's just like a brightness. Mm -hmm. And 
even in adulthood, they're still pretty patternless or it gets harder to tell as, mm -hmm. as an adult, mm -hmm. but so, so that, that one of that, that hypo went on to produce my leucistic animal. And then the sibling went on to not prove out to be hypo. Um, it's, it's subtle. And I do think, I do think it is possible that like part of, um, Part of it might be that the original animals were solid yellow and you, you paired them back to each other. Mm -hmm. And so it could be uh, part of the, uh, uh, the color. The color is yellow. Um, I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> so, so you're pairing yellow and yellow animals together. And if you do that over, over a few generations, you can almost completely yeah, remove yellow. melanin. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. You can have solid. Even if it, even if it weren't hypos. Even if it weren't right. hypos. Dark yeah. grove. Right. Dark mm -hmm. grove. Yeah. Right, right, right. With reds. Um, but so okay. But we all agree that Rory's ugly Lucy, <laughs> which no, we're dirty, all obsessed dirty with. Dirty Lucy. Which, which dirty. We're all obsessed with. We're all obsessed with a a, a Lucy that uh you know grows up to look like a a, a, a you know. A garden, like, right. basically. But hey, if, um, it, if it was but, just a white snake, it would be right. a dead end for selective breeding. Yeah. Sure. Right, exactly. That's so, true. but the so I have three from that from the three babies. Well, I don't want to call them babies now. I, I guess they're almost two years old at this point. But they're all various shades of yellow. And if if Lucy is simple recessive, like we're all assuming it is. Um, you know, I, I guess it would make sense that they're various shades of yellow. But if if I was going to say that they're, I can pick out the hypo. Um, well, they should all be hypos if they're from a Lucy, right? One of them is ridiculously dirty. I mean, like probably more black than yellow. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. um, and he wasn't. He wasn't. At, he was. He was heavily patterned as a baby, but he's just gaining more and more and more black as he as he ages. Does he have that like lemony, like yellow hue to him that Dayton's kind of well, describing? It's it's a little different. really the one the one female I got from you does, but the other two do not. They're just they just look dirt, dirty, right? Um, they do not have that extra like lemony hue to them. Mm -hmm. I have three more from um, I think uh, Keith Keith McPeak produced these. Um, and those are also various shades of yellow. Um, and he produced them from two, you know, supposed possible het Lucy, possible hypo, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, you know, I could see if those were my only hypos or pos het Lucy's, whatever you want to call them, you know, saying, okay, I know this one is going to be Lucy because it's got blue eyes. It's super clean yellow. There's not a single black scale on it. Um, and then the second one is pretty close to that, but it's got, you know, a couple little off color scales to it. And it's also extremely vibrantly yellow. And then this third one has got that kind of dirty overtone to it, but it's also solid yellow, you know, but it's not as vibrant, not as lemony as you just said. I so, kind of wish, I kind of wish we could have like a PowerPoint as we're, I know. Yeah, loaded right? up with slides of yeah. all, all these animals. You know, like <laughs> well, I can go. Discussing. I can go get them and show you each one individually. You want me to do that? <laughs> uh, Rory, Rory's Rory's is sort of a, and, and I know there are there are other like Jake had a, a melanistic uh, leucistic, and we have seen some that have various degrees of pattern, which I think is promising, um, because you can add other, you can start stacking genes to that. Mm -hmm. If you can see the pattern. Yep. Um, but my first hypo litter that I produced, I honestly didn't know what the fuck I was looking at. I was just like, what is this? Are these hypos? <laughs> Every what Amazon litter. That's I was what it is. What is to, this? <laughs> I was trying to talk to Chris about it. And I was like, Hey, can you tell me which one of these are hypos? You know? Cause like, it looks like a bright, you know, orangish yellow snake or whatever. Yeah. Um, but as they as they start to shed out, and as you've seen a few litters of them, at least in my collection, I've seen uh, something um, that is kind of hard to describe. It's it's sort of like a translucentness to the animal. Um, 
And I mean, if 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 I have a few pairs that prove out uh, this year, then there's there's no way that like I'm just picking these at random. Yeah. Well, it, I, I mean, mean it could... I was gonna say like I mean, regardless if they're incomplete, dominant, or recessive, we still they only have one copy of the gene. We still consider them heterozygous for that trait, anyways. So I mean, you could be line breeding like let's call it a lemon right, that are heterozygous, that have one copy of the gene, and you're just able to pick that out because it's a bloodline. I, I don't know. I mean, I, you guys have the experience here. I'm just kind of a new guy just kind of looking in and observing and, and, and asking a lot of questions. Well, that that's, Randy, exactly why I've started to wonder, you know, is it two genes? One is the, the yellow pattern list, and one is mm -hmm. the... It, it could be a bloodline and a gene, too. Yeah. The, the right. only Lucy I've ever seen in, in person was a big adult female that Chris McQuaid had at Daytona one year, and it was not a solid white snake, right? It was, he called it pepper. Right. Mm -hmm. It was, like, peppered, right? Like, it had, like, all of this melanistic scales to it. Now, here's the thing that I thought was the thing I want to ask you guys also about is, what do you think about tongue color? Is that animal no. had a pink and black, like, calico-striped, like, you know, tongue? And I actually have some of those same animals that Noah has that came from Keith McPeak that actually those are the ones from Bobby Pruitt. And those came from a Lucy litter. And a number of those that I have have either solid pink tongues or the same, you know, pink and black tongue that that, that Lucy that I saw that Chris had. And I wonder, is that possibly a marker? Well, if if, if I could say something, I would say that I've never really considered the tongue, but like a leopard has a black tongue. It also has metallic eyes. You don't get a calico born that I've seen with blue eyes. You all the hypo het Lucy's I've seen have blue, green or yellow eyes. So and if you you want to take an albino Amazon tree boa, so one of the most diverse snakes that we have in our collections and you can tell it's an albino because it has red pupils. Right. It's like the eyes of a leopard. They're metallic. So if I was going to look for a marker, I would start with the whole phenotype and narrow it down to what's consistent within right. what I'm looking for, whether it be eye color <clears throat> to Ian's point, tongue color, or a general phenotype of the animal. Yeah, but you have to compare with other people's um results too not just yourself so it's not an anecdotal you know anecdotal yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely uh, I'll, I'll say that um i haven't seen a ton of the hypo or het lucy animals i've seen a few of them and all the ones that i've seen have had that split by color tongue and whereas a lot of, i've i've looked at a lot of not uh het leucistic animals and the majority the vast majority have solid colored tongues whether that be lighter colored or darker colored it's not bi-colored or split mm -hmm. like the head hype or head leucistic stuff yeah i have random That's, gardens and yellows that have split tongues like yeah no i have at all I, it almost feels like in in all my litters i have both solid yeah. pink tongues and and split colored tongues i i can't i, I can't my founding that means my founding hypo male that proved uh you know, hat leucistic or hypo uh, had a had a solid black tongue. Mm. Hmm. But yes. I did have some. <laughs> yeah, I do have some did. hypos that have the split. <laughs> yeah. The split. Yeah. And, and yeah. it could be that it's nothing. But you know, if we're trying to play, you know, Dinker morph game, and we're looking for like the smallest little marker, markers. Yeah. 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 And, well, yeah. Keep it. Keep a note on that. Yeah. You know, I, so coming from green trees. So Marshall Mendez has been working on the albino green tree project forever, right? Mm -hmm. His adult female het albino green tree python, you know what color tongue she's got? Pink tongue. Black. Oh, pink, yeah, tongue. pink tongue. Yeah. And huh. all the green tree pythons I've ever produced, I've only produced one with a pink tongue. And that, so, one, that one came from uh, like several generations removed, but could have been you know, related to distantly to something that was on you know the same branch as, as the martial animals but uh, you know it just it strikes me as odd because i've got some of the offspring from those bobby pruitt animals that are just solid yellow 
and a solid pink tongue or a bicolor tongue. So maybe it's maybe it's nothing, but it just it, to me it's different than a lot of the other Amazons I've seen or produced. I know we don't have a large sample size of Lucy's, but I'm wondering if it's possible to this is based on the animals that have popped up in Europe. They're, I believe they're calling them blondes. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, are we going to have leucistic animals that we incorrectly identify as leucistic that mature different colors that are not actually genetically leucistic? Mm -hmm. So you might have an animal that's born a white animal, but matures into a different color and doesn't necessarily um, carry the gene. Because in some of these litters, like if you pair yellow to yellow animals, regardless if they're hypo or not, um, you can have very pale animals that look almost white or tan. Have that peachy kind of look to them. Yeah. 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 So... I, I, I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that, but I'm wondering. <laughs> yeah. Wait, no, are, are there any Lucy's in Europe? I, I didn't even think about that, but is anyone working with that gene in Europe? No. Well, wasn't uh, no. Was his name Stefan Ty? Wasn't he working with, it was either a really white calico or they were leucistic. Yeah, his or his are some kind of calico. Is it calico? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wild looking calicos. Can we so, talk about, so go ahead, Noah. Yeah, I, I we could talk about hypo all night and still never figure it out, right? No. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> we're not gonna figure it out. We just need to breed these things until we figure it out, right? I mean, that's yep. what we need to do with hypo. Can we go we back need more to more people working with them? That's what we need, right? We do. Yeah. So all you people out there, buy Amazon tree boats. Yeah, don't <laughs> worry. Like, and get into. Do the you have list. any parents yeah. coming this up that future. could produce a Lucy? Uh, I do. I yes. Hopefully. Cool. Uh, it, nothing is taken just yet, but it, it's in the works. All right. Heck yeah. Cool. I think that's uh, the best thanks. marketing for a species ever. Hey, we're really confused, so please buy them. Yeah. So we can Come on out. Everybody help. <laughs> <laughs> but I want okay. to go back to Calico Prince. for a minute. Orange. Yeah, take it to the lotto. Yeah, right. <laughs> I want to go back to Calico for a minute and Orange. Cause is someone seems like, like grinding something? I, I thought he was like putting a silencer on his gun or something. Like, what is he doing yeah. over there? <laughs> is, it, is it geckos? Oh, okay. yeah, I do yeah, have maybe. a couple geckos around. Or here. crickets? That could be that. Yeah. Okay. Right. Somebody, somebody in the comments asked if someone was sharpening a pencil. So <laughs> I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> um, orange. What I, I we we said a little earlier. Or I yeah. think it was Rory said a little earlier that there's no orange calicos out there. I have one that is, it's certainly not a high expression orange calico, but it's an orange snake, not a red snake, mm -hmm. um, that has a good bit of white on it and uh, a couple babies that he have produced have significantly more white on it than him and are also... It's like extremely vibrant orange. We talked about hypo for forever. And, and these yellow and orange snakes, they have like different shades of them. These are like very bright. There, there's no dirty overtone to them. They have that translucent almost look, you said, Dayton, to them. But they also have a ton of white. And just and like they Nick see, says, is these things, it could... It, it could be piebald, right? It, you know, we think they're all calico because they have some form of white, but it could be something else too. So, so yeah, but the, the snake has also produced calicos, red calicos with, with lots of white and black on them that are quite obviously calico. So, mm. so it, I feel like it has something to do with calico, <laughs> this orange. And there's a couple people out there who have orange snakes with a lot more white than than you know the ones yeah. the ones that I, I have. So I Jeff Godbold and Rory both have some orange ones like that too. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. Uh, really clean bicolors with that um, little bit yeah, of white with, calico, with like white the markings. Yeah. And, and just to clarify, um, yeah, I I, uh, 
I hear what you say, Noah. I, I do think that there is a connection there, obviously. He's producing, that snake is producing uh, highly visual red calicos for you. That's something that I've seen within my own collection as well that has led me to believe that maybe there is some sort of subtle pattern element that when combined with a recessive red animal yields that red calico coloration mm. and, um, effect that we're, that we're looking for. Um, in effort to kind of like clean up my calico lines, um, I've been really interested for a long time now into uh, breeding a lot of them into like uh, bicolor lines in order to just reduce melanin make things a little bit brighter. And um, now I've had the opportunity to uh, raise up some bicolor offspring and breed them to each other and other similar animals and produce visual red calicos from them. Um, and then from those litters, I've kept back some of the bicolor um, uh, siblings, raised them up, and there is a pretty big distinct difference between some of them. Are some they almost like very... bicolor calicos, or some of them look like mm -hmm. bicolor calicos, yeah. but the, the calico is is very subtle, or what I would categorize as being very subtle. Um, so when I said there is no such thing as a yellow or orange calico, I meant that there's no such thing as like the equivalent high expression um, mm -hmm. calicos mm -hmm. that we're used to seeing with the red base. Um, the red base color uh but i certainly do believe that the red calicos can be inherited through non-red um sure yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. so that yeah. would almost say that there could I, you know red and means, calico could be it means separated. rory's bicolors are heck calico some of them <laughs> some of them sure yeah <laughs> yeah because i Dave, think any what, the question to you in the beginning is, is you were focused so much on red. Do you think that just because of that <clears throat> focus on red, that the calico was kind of a byproduct from that and you just kind of worked with it? Or do you think that, you know, you, there's no way to separate those two, the pattern and the color? Um, so this is where it might get a little murky, mm -hmm. but there is something that makes a calico a calico the red and white combination now it's not just the white that makes the calico because almost every amazon tree boa has some kind of white on it you know so that that doesn't mean it's a calico sure um now the the patterned calicos you don't really see outside of red and you would think that that's the red doing something to like black because because uh, you have the white essentially be what like a black pattern would be. Yeah. In those in those oscillated calicos. It's almost like smudge prints of the black. But also the 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 tricky part of that is, is they can have black as well and they can have black pattern as well on top of that. So it's not it's not red messing with the black. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. Yeah, we all are. <laughs> White messing with the red. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, just because an animal has white, I, I don't think that makes it a calico. I've got um, completely unrelated animals, uh, some in my hypo line that that are that have quite a significant amount of white, but it, it seems to be. Uh, well, that's not necessarily true. They 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 can kind of have a, a underlying pattern as well um, that is either pale or yellow or or white, um, but it's it's mostly white speckling. So, so I'm thinking it's almost a different thing, different morph, different phenotype, whatever you want to call it. I've bred the snake to, you know, other calicos and and pet calicos. It makes calicos, but then I breed it to, I have a yellow tiger that is not head calico. And I know that because I've bred it a few times to calicos and it never makes any. Mm -hmm. um, does it produce birds at all? It doesn't produce anything red. It does produce orange oh, babies yeah. when I breed it to this one snake that has a lot of this one orange, orange snake. I call it Kraken. 
um, with, uh, with a bunch of white on it. So the babies I got from that this year, um, initially it didn't look like they had any white on them, but after the first shed, it was quite obvious that they had a, a good amount of white on them. So it almost feels like it's not recessive so with him. It's something different. There can be genes that are very <clears throat> closely like aligned in the genetic code. Mm -hmm. And and when they're similar like that, you can have things that like, let's like say red and now. orange, like let's say red yeah. and orange are very close genetically, and it, red is tied to calico. You might have something that where you have an orange animal from a calico line that could partially express the calico or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, because of how close it is to the red almost like a paradoxing bleed through kind of yeah or maybe well, it's allelic favorite. and it's just picking up that orange in the same spot that the red would have been picked up at right okay um yeah i don't know <laughs> right, well, that's what we're here right? <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. that's we're asking you i don't know that's why we're that's why we're here that's why we're, we're doing the things we're, doing. we're all giant nerds trying to figure things out and yeah. you know we have no Can idea i ask this question though <laughs> Dayton said earlier that, you know, all most all Amazon Tribos are increasing melanin, right? Besides a liger, why have we not seen a black snake? Mm. Did we I, have. If, if, yeah. What's that? We have. We have. Uh, occasionally, you see these Instagram pictures coming out of somewhere yeah, I've in seen South them too. America. I'm why don't we see them more? That's yeah. the project I'd be more interested in. Because you're not breeding them yet, damn it. Oh, no. People aren't. I think, <laughs> I think a lot of people are not breeding for that. I think because black is not a base color. Right. It's it's <clears throat> a pattern color. Yeah. And so okay. you can't you can't have a full patterned animal. Okay. Have you, you know seen what I'm saying? The, yeah. Have you seen the black Amazon the pictures of them? Yeah. There's been a I, couple I believe, of them. Yeah. The ones that I've seen, um, they are of leopard lineage, yeah, and usually. and they they start out looking very black, and, and even recently in Europe. So I think the one that gets passed around a lot was like one of Danny Mendez's animals. Yep. John, is, John yeah, John and Jane Camp. Oh, okay, John and Jane Camp, and, and everyone goes on to say, yeah, it matured out to be a normal looking leopard. Um, but like a lot of that stuff is so old, it's hard to kind of. Well, there's uh, been some new stuff last last year. I think um, Strictly or Joe Swatowski brought in a completely black one. Oh, I remember saying. And that who right knows now. who knows where the heck it went? Mm -hmm. um, I have it no idea where it is. Here. <laughs> it looked like yeah. it looked pretty rough. But then there's there's a couple other pictures <laughs> that I've seen floating around out there of of completely black. I mean. They're not adults, so it's very possible that they're mm -hmm. of leopard lineage, of leopard, just like yeah. that Danny Mendez snake. I would but say so. They're they're completely black, black bellies, black, black, everything. Everything's black. I know um, that they produced some leopards in like Austria or something like that. And that was a few years ago. And they did have some all black snakes in that litter. It was a full leopard litter. But I, I don't think that an all black Amazon's out of the question because Rory, some of those those amazing calicos that I saw at your place that you called dirty, that you said, I'm trying to breed all this black out of them. And then there was one <laughs> female in particular, I remember, that was like almost all black with a red head that I have a picture Ooh. of. Like, Damn. if you did the opposite, instead of trying to breed the black out of those, if you went the other direction, I feel like you could probably create an all black animal especially yeah. with the way that they get darker over time like that. Immature, per right? Perhaps, but it would be solid red as a neonate. Well, that's all right. It's solid yeah. red. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone will be. <laughs> I think melanism might be out there for these guys, and it, it yeah. might not be attached to leopard, or maybe it is. I, I'd love to have a black Amazon. I, I would need it just for the yeah. record Ian, to have that, a black that, Amazon. That, <laughs> that, female, that female of mine you referred to um, – is a somewhat infamous photo of mine from you know like 2011 ish i want to say uh that kind of circulated around reptile social media of just a crazy high expression 50 50 uh white and red banded uh red calico and 
yeah, as you say, you know, basically became so melanistic with maturity that uh, what was red is entirely black, um, save but a little bit of white pattern and red on the head. Yeah, I, I know you don't like that look, so you should just box her up and send her here to floor. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take but her. I think also people need to just be creative too, because you know we see these patterns and. Uh, you know, Rory's produced these ligers that, oh man, they look so cool and they're really dark as, as babies, but there's probably other routes to that too. You know, like I just popped out some Halloweens that were darker than normal and mm -hmm. they have a reduced pattern. So that just kind of made me think, well, that in conjunction with maybe an animal that does create a little bit extra more melon than some of the other ones, uh, and then selecting for a reduced pattern with the Halloween trait maybe I could yield something like that, you know, in 10 years or something like that anyways, you know? So I think we all just need to kind of be creative and, and start picking different routes that are, uh, you know, not necessarily orthodox. For sure. I think that that could be a really cool. And uh, I'm surprised that it hasn't been done yet, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's 20, there's, there's time to get on it. Yeah. There's, there's yeah, much more flashy animals out there, you know, so everyone wants to go for the reds and the calicos. That's, that's got most of all of us into it. You know, that's, that's why we love Amazons to begin with. But I think an all black Amazon is just badass. So yes, yeah. yes. Bobby, I, Bobby Pruitt tried for a long time to produce a hyper melanistic Amazon. I don't know whether he ever got close or not, but he, uh, on his website said that was one of his goals so i remember that i remember looking through all those halloween halloween pairing pictures and looking at all those babies now that really that liger thing. that i just picked up from rory thank you again um <laughs> is extremely Cheers. melanistic it's a very very melanistic <clears throat> snake was born nearly solid black yeah it looked yeah. amazing as a baby i i think that you know that still does it's a great. Experience. I was going to say not as nice in Jake's collection, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I think just to show you guys, though, like, you know, to, to Dayton's point or earlier, we're really at the ground level because you mm -hmm. think about the choices we each make based on what we like. You know, Rory doesn't like a lot of black in his calicos. That's why his, his calicos are, are so white and, bl and, and, and red. They don't have a lot of black. It reminds me of. of in green trees trooper walsh liked red neos so yep. he, he kept all the red ones and sold all the yellow ones he didn't care what they looked like so <laughs> as a breeder especially when you're early on and figuring some of this stuff out each of us like something different so we breed for different traits so we're molding it based on what we each like yep and so yeah. we're we're gonna we're gonna find over time that you know the animals are gonna trend in a certain direction it doesn't necessarily mean that the genetics aren't there underlying we just never selected for it, right? Like, yes. Or he could probably go the other direction. Instead of getting rid of the black, you could probably create that all black. So I think a lot of it is is sort of up to us at this stage as the breeders is you know, what are the looks, what are the phenotypes that we're looking for? Obviously, I mean, we want the genotype as well, but it's really a matter of, of what catches our eye. You know, I mean, if, if you like yeah. ligers, you're going to produce ligers. If you like patternless yellow snakes, you're going to produce more of those and, and so and, and what's cool is we have so many examples of all these other species right carpet pythons ball pythons corn snakes that have showed us what is possible within snakes right it's crazy to me that some people have looked at ball pythons and said i think i can pull something out of this and have created what they have today that's crazy to me if you look at Amazon tree bows, we have a greater starting range yes. already, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and so I think that opportunity is actually larger than ball pythons. Uh, and where's the red ball it. python. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, the red real, Amazon tree. Of those orange ones, man. Yeah. <clears throat> it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. No, it's one of the things that I, I enjoy about them too. Like I, I oftentimes, especially when we're talking about, uh, certain polygenic traits that that we're trying to adjust and tweak I, I always think back to a lot of colubrid breedings you know look at looking back at 15 years ago what corn snakes looked like you know to now some of like like i do a lot of the uh the coral stuff 
um that was all originally just like oh this animal's got like a little bit of pink to it and i like that and i want to see what i can get out of that now or now fast forward we're hatching out snow corns that are hatching out freaking pink yeah and it and it makes no sense you know but again to your to your point randy like we and ian like we've we've figured out these things that we like and we've just we've ran with it with so yep. many different species and and i agree amazons have so much more at the ground floor for us to really tweak like there's so many different directions we can go and i think that's one of the things that makes them such a wonderful species um you know similar to like rob and i geek out about borneo short tails all the time you know because it's like there's so many different directions within that species that you can go and you can isolate you know and it makes that it makes the journey as the keeper and the breeder and the visionary for the project that much more amazing yeah you know, if we all just start double clutching our females every year, you know, oh man, but yeah, I mean, instead of every other year, <laughs> you know, yeah, right. <laughs> if you look at <laughs> Stefan or Stephen Ty, if you look at his breeding records for a long time, he was breeding snakes back to back year after year. Yeah. And oh, I so think you could definitely do that, it with, you know? with, with well, Amazon. Just, that, yeah, I think we yeah. just need to read our snakes, you know, like some of yeah. them won't bounce back and some of them may. Yeah, some of yeah. them need two or three years to bounce back and some, some of, of them, them look, like, look it, yeah. like some of them look like they didn't even have babies a week and a half and one meal after they just mm -hmm. dropped a litter of 10. So, yep. I mean, um, you know, it, it, it depends. I haven't, I, I don't breed them back to back years. I always give them a year off, but uh I definitely think you can and and have seen many people do it. I've done it before. Yeah. Yep. And we learn now that you can breed them at a really young age, right? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone here knows what I'm talking about. I don't Barely a year now. old. Right. <laughs> and they're eight feet long. Yeah. <laughs> Two and a half year old females. And, yeah. Randy, don't say it. You say his name three times. It's like, <laughs> oh no no i don't see anything wrong with it if if the animals are healthy though you know and and he had success doing it so what can we say that it was wrong or bad morally or ethically but i mean if the snakes are fine then what is he really doing wrong i think it was for one season overall you sure. know so it's it's hard to um say if there's going to be any long-term effects yeah exactly and that's the part we we worry about because we are you know long-term keepers we've either had these animals for a long time or we have visionaries uh, vi yeah exactly we have a long projected future with them yeah yeah it hurts me every time i lose a snake i lost um my mm -hmm. paradox last I year know, was man. my favorite was grieving snake, but that's just, what we say. Um, you, you can't call out your you favorites because you know how. Yeah, yeah. It's it's just, obvious. I, I it likes did. to humble you. But yeah, she was. It did. I mean, you know, some sort of tumor in the lower intestines or something like that. I sent her off for necropsy, but I wish I didn't. I wish I just preserved her because they they keep them once they <laughs> necro them. At least the yeah. people I send them to do. So, um, she. Uh, yeah, it's tough to lose a snake. So that's why I just yeah. you know. Every other year, give them a break, sometimes three, if that's what they look like they need. Yeah. And, and Rory, real quick, you had something earlier you were talking about that, you know, when you were producing, you're trying to produce clean bicolors, a byproduct of that was a calico. Um, well, the, the goal of the pairings were to, uh, I was already starting from calico with those. Oh, okay. Ones. Okay. So yeah, I, that I was have... breeding calicos to, um, bicolors okay. in an effort to lighten up the calicos themselves. So one of the projects that I'm using, like, uh, the reason I picked a uh, freak show from you is because he fit so well in my project. I've been reaching out to, uh, Brandon Kreis and Ryan Young and Dayton, and I'm finding these animals that, um, and even Noah's uh, bougie that I got from him, it's it's like uh, they're different kind of looking calicos. They, you know, you wouldn't expect a calico to come out from that. Um, or like Ryan Young, he's trying to, you know, strengthen that bicolor look and he just gets these random red calicos come out, you know. And it, I'm sure it's heck calico within the line, but 
uh, that's kind of where I'm basing my project off of those ones and seeing if that's any something different or just another calico, you know, but I, I think all these Dinker projects are really going to start. We can't really say anything uh, set in stone until we do the work for I, it. You know, I, I have sold so many calico siblings over the years. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised there's not more of them popping out in, right. in <laughs> other collections. I do think there's a lot of calico hiding in people's collection that they oh, don't yeah. know about. Yeah, I, I, see mean, it. You know, I see it. It's all over the place. See beds there. pop out. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Well, guys, we've uh, hit two hours, which Woo! I quickly. feel like I feel like uh, very quickly, and I feel like we could continue to go, but I think we're gonna round this out um, and, and do a this, part this, two. This means we need to have a part two. Happen. Yes, uh, this, this love was to. really great, and and uh, you know I'm glad that we got to shed some light on species that it is really shrouded in a lot of uh, misunderstanding. Uh, both genetically and just as, as keep for keeping as well. Um, it's a good thing we clarified all of that. Today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, in case you were wondering, <laughs> we don't know shit. Thanks so much, guys. This was great. <laughs> hey, kudos to you guys for like organizing this. I think this is like the most Amazon tree boa knowledge that's been on a round table kind yeah. of thing you know so far yes until yeah. we have our second one yeah, yeah. Thank well, i don't you. even know yeah. if jeff godbolt is his stuff still up i tried to listen to rory's episode the other day and i don't think it airs anymore oh i so don't know this, this sure. is pretty much it um I mean, I, I, yeah I, you can find corrales well i haven't even looked in a long time but if you yeah. google well, it, you'll find it somewhere i'm sure it's got to be yeah. somewhere blog maybe, talk maybe or... for round two we get we get uh we jeff get on jeff here. on here too yeah yeah yeah, yeah that'd sure. be sweet but, you definitely uh, need, yeah definitely need more corrales content and uh someone said it earlier rory you need to post more pictures yeah you should do <laughs> that rory please you should do. do that or just send them all right let me let me, let me go look for the camera i'll do <laughs> yeah, that. please this, this way we don't have to keep going to your website and crying about how depleted our bank accounts <laughs> have to get <laughs> crying, or crying crying when the snake you wanted to buy is already gone yes i don't yeah. i literally don't tell anybody about rory's <laughs> website until i select the animal i want right. yeah <laughs> exactly there's, oh, there's been some times this, randy we'll talk to this guy right there's been some times Ra randy and i have shot pictures back and forth from rory's website be like have you seen this one yeah i kind of yeah. want to buy it too late i already got it sucker <laughs> <laughs> oh god Dude, but hell yeah thank, thank you guys so so much yes for, for real and, thank and, you and sharing all of your knowledge with us it, it's this was really fun and we definitely need to do round two for sure yes and uh if you guys want to just start at the top and just work your way down to working out your social media so people can check you guys out and the stuff that you're working with that'd be cool yeah okay i'm on uh instagram at amazon eden a-M-A-Z-O-N-E-D-E-N. -E -E and you can find me on Facebook under Jacob Brooks. Hell yeah. Bam. Go ahead, Noah. So 2 by 2 Reptiles Reloaded on Instagram. I have a old account on there, 2 by 2 Reptiles, that was hacked. And I don't control anymore. It tends to send <laughs> random people hacky messages and stuff like that. So <laughs> if you're going to follow it, just report it. <laughs> like, follow 2 by 2 Reptiles reloaded on instagram and then i have a facebook too but i i do not check that very often um so uh message me through instagram hell yeah heck yeah and uh me you know i've been on here before but you can follow me on uh facebook if you want but i probably won't accept it go to my instagram and look up randall piggies r-a-n-d-a-l-l-p-e-g-u-e-s uh, that's where all my snake stuff is. Facebook's more for like family and friends. So. Hell yeah. Uh, you can find my availability at my website, canopylabexotics.com. If you're looking for a bunch of photos, you can go dig up my old Facebook profile, uh, Rory Gresco. I should have a decade worth of litter pics and everything you could want to see if you if you just head there. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at HDR Boreals. Um, give me a follow if you want to. Check out my availability. Yeah. Yeah, and you can find us, uh, S&J Reptiles, on Facebook and Instagram. We've got a bunch of Amazons available right now on our Morph Market page. And I uh, just want to give a shout-out to everyone at Tinley this weekend. 
And uh, special shout out to buddy Keith McPeak, who uh, yes, have on for Bullens. I feel like he could be part of an Amazon roundtable any day as well. Yeah, Just big influence on me getting into Amazons. Um, and also a shout out to to Harlan Wall and to Bill Hughes, also big influences that. Yeah. Morales. So uh, shout out to those guys. Thanks again for Hell yeah. guys. This was great. We should do it more. Boom. Yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Cool. Well, that is going to wrap this up. So thank you guys again fun, for man. coming on. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll keep that group chat going so we can figure out round two. <laughs> cool. Thank yes, you. Sir. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. Cheers, everybody. Good night. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. <laughs> Well, Rob, that was uh, everybody. Pretty... Everybody dipped. <laughs> uh, I I know everybody. Everybody did dip. We're we're still we're still running it live. But okay, yeah, this okay. was this was this was fun. This was sweet. Yeah, was I think that fun. there's still a lot to talk about when it comes to this. Yeah, exactly. Like I knew as soon as we got to genetics, it was going to be like that's a wrap. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. But heck yeah, no, I'm I'm super super excited with how this went. So heck yeah. Can't wait for round two. But let's go. Hopefully All right. I'll have a better voice by then. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we need that announcer voice of yours back, Rob. Listen here then, okay? Oh, God. No, we're done. We're done. <laughs> Angry messages. They're already coming from the UK. Goodbye, everybody.